on the other end of the scale. And it just occurred to me, they say ignorance is bliss. And my nickname is Smiley, so make it that might be real. Um, what I'm going to talk about here are some basic research that Andrew Negri and I have undertaken the names around early recruitment. And the research was triggered by our curiosity about measuring recruitment as a fundamental process. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah. So assuming level supply, either natural or enhanced, is not a constraint, then what happens next in terms of settlement survival is fundamental for reef renewal. So we're going to explore the influence of variations in substrate form at very small scales. There we go. Starting. So measuring coral recruitment, the usual process is the deployment of some sort of settlement substrate. The spawning happens, the recruits come in, they metamorphose, produce the skeleton, and take on those in the belly. The recruitment devices, typically tiles, are recovered, bleached, and the recruits are counted. That gives us our data on recruitment. Now the typical densities, if you extrapolate from tiles that are four by four inches, or 10 by 10 centimetres uh, to the square metre. The typical densities on the GDR are in the thousands per square metre each year. Uh, one to 5,000 is common. Uh, however, if you go out and then count the abundance of juveniles at around five centimetre plus a year, year and a half old, there's only 1% of those left. The densities are down to 10. So, like everyone's mentioned, type three is the viral group. So we've been interested in trying to understand is there a better way to measure recruitment rates and potentially to see if, as part of that research, we might be able to push that curve a little bit so that practitioners that want uh, a more efficient delivery of uh, juvenile and then ultimately adult corals might get 10% through to the spawning age, not 1%. Now, Part of this research was driven by an observation that there's going to be great benefit in standardising measures of recruitment. It's a pretty fundamental metric uh, to understand whether reefs need intervention or not. So deploying and recovering substrate is a standard approach around the world, but the materials and methods are not standardised. Substrate orientation of those in situ arrangement and the timing and deployment are all variable in the literature, so it makes it very difficult to see uh, comparing apples and apples. The other thing about the, if you look at those slides in the top, which are typical of many of the tiles put on the GBR, is that the relative recruitment varies with the top and bottom and even the edges of those tiles, and also the subsequent survival has a differential effect depending on which aspect they land on. So this got us thinking about whether a more three-dimensional recruitment device might be more useful given the reef itself is three-dimensional. Now this is a fun bit because the idea of three-dimensional objects as recruitment devices was triggered by golf. Um, I happened to be swimming around reefs in Japan, cleaning up golf balls that had washed onto the reef and were swirling around in sperm groups. And noticed that on some of those golf balls there was pink crustose coralline algae. Now that became a bit of a mental trigger because the crustose coralline algae is known to induce settlement metamorphosis, at least in some species of like corporates. So the fact that the CCA was there meant that we thought, well, maybe we'll give golf balls a whirl as a three-dimensional uh, settlement object. So we did. So the bottom there is a standard PGA golf ball. I don't play golf, but PGA, international standard. And <laughs> I have to go through this quickly, but in, in a nutshell, the little things on the golf ball and close up to, to the right of that so golf balls attracted about 50 recruits each in that initial trial. A couple of key observations 
they settled all over, but they favoured the dimples. So that tells you that at the millimetre and some millimetre scale of dimples, there's an effect. So the micro texture of the surface. The second observation, well there are many, but the second is that if you look at the next photo over on the bottom right, all the recruits at three months of age, all the survivors were in the bottom half, the southern hemisphere, which is probably good for us. Yeah? <laughs> so, so that tells you that the scale of the object at centimetres aspect is important and appears to be influencing survival. So find very fine scale rugosity in an aspect coming into play. So we thought we'd explore that a bit further. So next step, 2009, we did what Megs and I called the Tiger Woods experiment. <laughs> golf balls versus ceramic versions, facsimiles of golf balls that I made with various increasing levels of fine scale rugosity. So there was a smooth one which had an impressed dimpling like, uh, like dimples on a golf ball. And then uh, medium and coarse levels of pitting based through lost organic firing of the ceramics. So the results of that experiment, again, they love the micro rugosity and the dimples, but if you look below that, you see the larvae stuffed into those micro pits. And the data on the right shows a couple of interesting things. Firstly, that there's an increasing attractiveness to recruits with increasing fine scale rugosity. This is blatantly obvious, don't need to run any stats on that one. The other thing is though that again we confirmed in this repeat trial that regardless of the nature of the substrate, golf balls of polyurethane um, or ceramic or the rugosity, that survival over, what was that, five weeks, favoured the ones in the bottom half of the spheres. Now spheres are interesting because they provide all potential aspects available for the larvae to choose. So we wanted to then pursue these two elements of very fine scale rugosity and aspect at centimetre scales and that led us to the next phase, which was 3D printing. So we were able to test a range of shapes and colours originally. And 3D printing is very convenient, you can do it on your laptop. It spits out precise metrics for uh, the area of substrate you're exposing for recruitment. And you can play around with it really easily. And in all these trials we use the old traditional terracotta tiles as a reference or control material. We did five shapes, multiple colours, however, trouble in censusing burial when you settle juveniles on the lighter colours because they're translucent as well, meant we abandoned those and went for the reds and chocolates uh, for the last couple of years. So some of the observations of the 3D printing, uh, the orange graph there is a, a representation, quantitative representation of different shapes, that to right pyramids, grids, spheres and squares, including the terracotta tile squares. Um, and that shows some um, relative mortality in the CSIM, National Sea Simulator, over a particular period of about three weeks. I won't go into too much detail other than to say that the percent mortality varied with this shape. But we also found that in the extreme case we had up to 45% mortality over a three week period on one of the two of those shapes. And that gives us caution if we're coming up with a universal settlement device it also means we need to have a standard protocol for the timing of deployment and recovery. If there's variation in that timing when you pull devices off the reef, you're going to then introduce extraneous artefacts into your data. <coughs> so, grids and pyramids were the most attractive to new recruits. <coughs> Survival at 100 days ranged from 9 to 37%. But all shapes had some survival to 100 days. So from a restoration practitioner's point of view, it may not matter if all you want to do is get one or two survivors on a device over the long term. Nevertheless, some are more efficient than others. So there are some key outcomes from this research. Settlement was achieved on all shapes, plastic and ceramic. And we have other data related to the effects of subject type. As I said, golf balls are 
polyurethane coated. We've had several in the polypropylene, PVC, and, uh, and so forth. The plastic used in this trial is polylactic acetate, which is a cornstarch derived, so called biodegradable, and in fact, it's really just compostable plastic. Um, now, traditional terracotta tiles and the data that's been derived from them in published studies. Uh, they perform pretty well, middle of the pack, and quite good in relative to other shapes in longer term survival out to 100 days at least. The surface micro rugosity observations, stuff that's less than a millimetre, um, remain consistently an attractive feature on any shapes you want to put out there. What we did when we moved to 3D printing though, other than me creating micro pits in ceramics, the 3D printer we had had a constraint on resolution of the print to 200 microns. Given the range of larval sizes on GBR spawns, if you sense it's asleep, somewhere between 2 and 800 and spinomodal around acroprids and non acroprids we didn't know whether we could come up with optimum size pits with the 3D printer. So we came up with the idea to substitute <laughs> pits with a universal pit, effectively an angle. Now the angle means that if a larvae wants a smaller hole, it just wedges itself in tighter. And you'll see this in devices that are out there, same core shapes, the grooves and so forth. That's what's going on. The groove provides all the options for size of micro refuge scale, sub-millimetre scale. Now, the two photos to the right, or yeah, to the right, they show one of the shapes, it's a three-dimensional stepped pyramid, we call it. In that one, the steps are five millimetres high. Now, the top photo, you probably can't resolve, but the pale white lines on the grooves are the lines on recruits. There was the odd recruit out of the flat, but they are very strongly associated, almost you know, above 99% with the grooves. The bottom photo is a magnification down the microscope of that, where all the recruits are packed in those grooves. And what this means, this is repeated over and over, is that we can direct where the larvae settle on these devices by where we put these micro-refuges. Potentially that then gives us the ability to engineer shapes for particular outcomes, knowing where on those shapes those recruits are. So, Particular outcomes, here's an example of a grid. This is for my stylized version of a device that represents an appropriate table coral skeleton. Because in the literature, Carmen Wallace in the 80s did a study on recruitment where she used cots eaten corals as substrates found that up to 34% survival to 16 months was on table appropriate. So grids were attractive to me. This is a stylized table coral, if you like. Now, just an example, you can engineer in the design to factor in appropriate exposure to light and water flow, protecting from predation, shelter from sedimentation, whatever you like. Now, also you can factor in if you're going to do recruitment studies, which is what I'm interested in, easy deployment and recovery. However, for permanent deployment for those practitioners that want to grow corals, I'd recommend that we might want to avoid the whole plastics issue and move to ceramics, which we've done and I've got some plastic versions and some porcelain versions here now. If people want to see me later and have a, have a look at that material. So where are we going to take this research? It's just a little niche study. There are two things, as I said, I'm particularly interested in moving towards a universal coral recruitment device that hopefully would find acceptance with peers so we can get some standardisation of recruitment data at scale. But associated with that from what we've seen here, we obviously need standard documented protocols. The second more niche development is the engineering to, for particular species and particular habitats where we might want to get some uh, enhanced survival in the restoration kind of space. So just quickly, what will standardisation bring? Standardisation enables us to provide a context for recruitment data locally, within reef, regionally, or even globally. The analog here, FinPrint, aims are heavily involved in this. It's a global program to assess reef shark populations funded philanthropically, I believe, through the Paul Allen Foundation or Trust. 
This is simply to show they have a standard protocol. This is where they've been with the red dots and where they're going. That little niche going off to look at specialised engineering shapes for enhanced survival in particular booty sub-habitats. This is an old schematic. The pink bit might be the remaining habitat with coal, but it's downstream. The black bit's a dead reef, but they may be in confronting high energy habitats. There's an application there where you may, rather than a mass deployment into more benign environments, find value in boutique engineering of substrates for survival that can be deployed in fewer numbers, but with the idea of creating ultimately micropopulations and spawning hotspots to seed those reefs. Last acknowledgements. The original observations in Japan are also being supported by Sasaka Marine Station at the University of Ryukyu. The initial settlement trials of the golf balls were supported in the domes by the staff in the Saltwater Precinct. Neil Jeeves and the, the Owners Workshop provided uh, fantastic support for sitting with design and fabrication 3D printing. And all the 3D printing trials since 2015 have been supported by the Owners staff in the National Sea Simulator. Thank you.